On the evening of February 2nd, 2008, 24-year-old Lindsay Buziak was a bag of nerves. The budding real estate agent was due to meet up with a mysterious woman for the purpose of showing her a lucrative million-dollar home in the Canadian city of Victoria. Lindsay was excited about the possibility of closing on a huge deal and making a large commission, but a part of her was also somewhat apprehensive. A mysterious woman had called Lindsay up just days earlier, saying that she and her husband required a house that was readily available. The would-be client had called Lindsay on her personal cell phone, something she found to be rather unnerving. Lindsay told her father that she thought the woman had sounded weird, so she was going to have her boyfriend wait outside when showing the property to the woman. This, Lindsay hoped, would ensure her safety, should it turn out that her client had something more sinister than just house fearing plant. She was wrong. Lindsay Busiak was born on November 2nd, 1983 on Vancouver Island. It's maybe worth pointing out that Vancouver Island is not the same as the city Vancouver, which is actually in mainland Canada and about 80 miles away. According to Google, Vancouver Island is a 300 kilometer long island full of rainforests, small cities, villages, beaches and wilderness that sits just off the southwest coast of mainland Canada. Lindsay's parents were Jeff and Avalyn. She also had a younger sister named Sarah, whom she was particularly close to. By the time she was in her early 20s, Lindsay had decided to follow in her father's footsteps and become a real estate agent. Even though her father was no longer a constant presence in her life, Lindsay's parents had divorced back in the 90s. Avalyn was awarded custody of the couple's two daughters. Just a few years later, Jeff moved across the country to Calgary in the province of Alberta. One day, Lindsay was at a real estate workshop when she bumped into Jason Salo. The two hit it off but wouldn't become an item until the following year. At this point, Lindsay was in a stormy relationship with a man named Matt McDuff. In 2006, Lindsay passed all of her exams and was now officially a licensed real estate agent. Seeing as she wasn't even 25 years old yet, it is perhaps fitting that she went to work for a company called Maverick. After breaking up with Matt McDuff, Lindsay and Jason Salo became an item. Eventually, she left Maverick and went to work at Remax Camusum, which was the same brokerage firm where Jason worked. They moved into a condo and from the outside it appeared as if their relationship was on the up. But then, in December of 2007, Lindsay travelled to Calgary to visit her father. Jeff later stated that his daughter told him she was concerned that maybe Jason wasn't as ambitious as she was. A few weeks later, Lindsay received a cold call from a woman who spoke with a strong accent, a little bit like myself. <laughs> Lindsay reckoned that the woman sounded either Mexican or Spanish. The woman told Lindsay that her husband had been transferred to Vancouver Island and they required a million dollar home in the city of Victoria that was available immediately. Lindsay was taken aback. She found it strange that a potential client should be contacting her on her personal cell phone. She found it equally suspicious that anybody should be asking her to find them such an expensive home. Lindsay was good at her job, but she lacked experience. When Lindsay asked the woman how she had gotten her number, the caller explained that Lindsay had been referred to her. I heard it mentioned in different sources that the caller actually told Lindsay who it was that had referred her, but when Lindsay called this middle person up to confirm the caller's story, 
the individual was out of town on a holiday. There is no mention of this though in police documents. Apparently, the caller never told Lindsay who it was that had referred her and when Lindsay called around trying to find out, none of her previous clients could recall referring Lindsay to anybody with a foreign accent. This only heightened Lindsay's suspicions. There were more calls in the following days between Lindsay's phone and the mysterious client. Lindsay never saved an actual name against the client's number on her phone. Instead, the number was saved under the nickname Million Dollar. But if the lady who had been speaking with Lindsay did ever give her a name, it was almost certainly fake anyway. Ultimately, Lindsay told her supposed client that she had maybe found a suitable property. 1702, the Sousa Place. On the night before Lindsay was supposed to show the home to the maybe Mexican, maybe Spanish woman, her boyfriend Jason noticed that she still appeared to be nervous. He offered to carry out the showing himself. Jason was a hulking ice hockey player. If the prospector was indeed planning some funny business, they'd think twice once Jason showed up. In the end, it was decided that Lindsay would do the showing herself, but Jason would wait outside the property. The couple said goodnight and went to bed, not knowing the evil that was waiting just over the horizon. On February 2nd, the day Lindsay was scheduled to show the property, she arrived at her office and asked a receptionist to look into the phone number Million Dollar had given her. Lindsay asked the receptionist to check with other agents in Victoria to see if they recognised the number. Presumably, Lindsay was wondering if maybe somebody else working in the industry could vouch for the person she was going to meet that day. Nobody could. The phone number Lindsay had provided was not recognised by anybody and for good reason. The phone in question was a prepaid burner phone that had been purchased in Vancouver sometime in late 2007. This phone was only ever used to call Lindsay Buziak, nobody else. Whoever owned the phone had bought it for the sole purpose of tricking Lindsay Buziak and luring her to a brutal and untimely death. On the morning of the day of the fearing, the client called Lindsay at the condo where she and Jason lived. Lindsay wasn't home at the time, so Jason offered to give the woman her cell phone number. The caller told Jason that she already had it. Jason would later tell police that the woman had spoken with what sounded to be a broken Spanish accent. At 4.24pm, Lindsay and Jason paid for their food at a restaurant and left in separate vehicles. Jason made his way to an auto repair shop to pick up a friend and it is assumed that Lindsay returned to the couple's apartment to get ready for her big showing at 1702 De Souza Place. Jason and his friend, a man named Cohen Oatman, had planned to go play some ice hockey. Jason explained that first he needed to go help Lindsay with a house viewing, something Oatman had no problem with. Unfortunately, the street where Lindsay was showing the house was so new that it didn't show up on Jason's satnav. Jason called Lindsay to ask for directions, but as the two were talking, the client and a male companion suddenly showed up. At 5.30pm, a witness on De Souza Place saw Lindsay Buziak shaking hands with a man and a woman. These two individuals were presumably Lindsay's clients. The man was described as being approximately six foot tall, white and with dark hair. His female companion was described as being blonde haired between the ages of 35 and 45 and she was also wearing a distinctly coloured dress as shown here. Lindsay was then seen entering the house on De Souza Place with the couple. One can only speculate, but there's a good chance that by now, Lindsay was very perturbed. The female caller had told her 
that she would be viewing the house alone, but for some reason she had shown up with a male acquaintance. A few minutes later, Lindsay sent Jason a text with directions to the house, but he was already en route, having obtained the location from his brother. At 5.41pm, Lindsay's phone left a voice message to an acquaintance whom she was not in regular contact with. Only some muffled noises could be heard, and it is believed that the message was a pocket dial. Meanwhile, Jason and his friend pulled up outside. Jason looked up at the house. A man was walking out the front door, but upon seeing Jason's Range Rover, he abruptly turned around and shut the door. Jason assumed that the showing was just beginning, and, not wanting to get in the way, drove out of the cul-de-sac and parked up in a nearby street. Unbeknownst to Jason, his girlfriend had just been subjected to a brutal knife attack and was either dead or in the process of dying. A few minutes passed and Jason sent Lindsay a text asking if she was okay. He didn't receive a response. So he parked a little closer to the house and called Lindsay. Once again, he received no reply. At around 6pm, both Jason and his friend Cohen got out of the Range Rover and walked right up to the front door of 1702 the Sousa place. Jason tried opening the door, but it was locked. When he rang the doorbell several times without a response, Jason began to worry. Determined to gain entry to the house, he called the estate agent and asked for the code to the garage, but for whatever reason, this code didn't work. Shortly after 6pm, Jason called the police. He explained that his girlfriend had been a little worried about doing a house viewing for someone she'd never even met and that he had been waiting nearby for assurance. But now he couldn't get in touch with his girlfriend and he couldn't get inside the house. It appeared as if Lindsay's gut feeling had been right all along. As Jason was talking to the 911 operator, Cohen grabbed his attention. The two men looked over a fence at the side of the house. They saw that a pair of French doors were lying wide open. Jason quickly helped his friend over the fence. After gaining access to the house, Cohen rushed to the front door and let Jason inside. Jason immediately rushed up the stairs only to find Lindsay lying in a pool of her own blood and slumped against the wall of the master bedroom. Jason shouted down to Cohen. When Cohen came up to the bedroom and saw his friend desperately performing CPR on Lindsay, he dialed 911 and summoned an ambulance. When paramedics arrived, they didn't take long to pronounce Lindsay dead. She had been stabbed several times. Jason Salo and Cohen Oatman were immediately taken into custody, but it was proven that they couldn't possibly have carried out the murder. Both men were seen on the CCTV at the auto repair shop. Plus, there were witnesses who had seen Lindsay enter 1702 de Souza Place with an unknown couple. This mysterious man and woman quickly became the focus of the investigation. Crime scene analysis showed that Lindsay hadn't been robbed and she hadn't been sexually assaulted. This murder appeared to be personal. When detectives learned that Lindsay Busiak had been supposed to meet a mysterious woman on the day of her death, it became apparent that somebody had specifically targeted the 24-year-old. But why would somebody want Lindsay Busiak dead? She was a well-liked young woman with her whole life ahead of her. Detectives were able to trace the phone that Lindsay had been in contact with in the weeks leading up to her death. The phone in question was a burner phone that had been purchased in Vancouver three months before Lindsay's murder. It had never been used until the first time Lindsay spoke with the unknown woman and it was only ever used to call Lindsay's cell phone and her home phone. It had never been used until the first time Lindsay spoke with the unknown woman and it was only ever used 
to call Lindsay's cell phone and her home phone. The phone was deactivated a short time after Lindsay's murder. The so-called crime phone, as investigators dubbed it, was purchased under a fake name, but was registered to a real business address in Vancouver. However, detectives are confident that this address has no connection to the case and was simply chosen at random by whoever bought the phone. Cell phone tower pings show that the crime phone travelled to Victoria via the ferry from Vancouver the previous day, which begs the question, just where did the person who was in possession of the phone spend the night? Days turned to weeks turned to years, and the investigation into Lindsay's murder went absolutely nowhere. To this day, nobody has any idea who killed Lindsay or why. The identities of the man and woman she was seen entering 1702 de Souza Place with has never been established. One theory that is at least entertained by detectives is that Lindsay was murdered because some criminals wrongly believed that she had given information to the police that ultimately led to one of the largest drug busts in Canadian history. Over the course of a year, police in Alberta seized 80 kilograms of cocaine and arrested 14 people. A few weeks after returning from her visit to her father in Calgary, Lindsay made a Facebook search for a relative of one of the individuals who was arrested. She also tried to reach this person by phone. This is the only evidence supporting the theory that Lindsay may have been executed by a criminal gang who suspected her of being an informer. Personally, I think this theory is nothing more than clutching at straws on the part of law enforcement. Lindsay was not a drug user. She did not have any criminal acquaintances. And surely, if she had been a police informer, then police in mainland Canada would have made their colleagues in Victoria aware of this. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And to me, this theory sounds so ludicrous that I actually debated whether or not to mention it. I doubt we'll ever know who killed Lindsay or just why she specifically was targeted. But it seems to me that if law enforcement could work out how the killer got a hold of her personal cell phone number in the first place, then the entire case might be blown wide open. Okay, we'll leave it there for today, folks. Let me know what you think in the comments section, and if you liked this video, please consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks.